I'm Scott Lowe. I'm the IB Diploma Program and Alternative Pathway Coordinator. The following presentation was given to parents and students in grade 10 um, with the goal of giving them an overview of the program as well as answering any questions they may have had about the course of study that will be started in grade 11. All right, so what we're going to be doing today, um, I'm going to be sharing with you something that I'm very passionate about. Uh, something that before I came to St. Andrew's School, I knew nothing about. I mean, the diploma program and the IB and all this stuff, my first year here was uh, very new. And, um, and I just since then have learned a whole lot about it. And of course, I'm now serving in the role of the IB coordinator. So again, my name is Mr. Lowe for anyone that doesn't recognize me. But uh, that's what we're going to be doing today. So. Um, we always like to begin with our St. Andrew's mission and vision because again, if we really are a school that's doing what we're saying we're doing, this is the focus of everything that we're doing. And I'm not going to read them word for word for you, but I will pull out a few key phrases in here that I think embody um, a lot of what the IB does for you. Um, and so obviously it's a high quality international education. This is a, um, a curriculum study that is done all over the world. So students in Asia, Africa, all over the world are doing this very same course of study, which is very powerful. Um, it, is a, it is a program that helps you develop your intellectual curiosity. It is not a rote learning program at all. Uh, we do give them a lot of information that they do need to take in, but at no point are we asking them to just simply regurgitate that on a piece of paper for us and say, well done, you remembered this stuff. Uh, the IB's focus is a lot on critical thinking and applying and analysis and so forth. So you have to use that knowledge um, to do something with it, which really is the real world in action, isn't it? Um, to inspire positive action and promote a global vision. So we want our students to learn skills that are going to allow them to continue what St. Andrew's students have been doing for generations now, which is to leave us and go out into that wider world and have a huge impact on things, okay? So we have alumni that are involved in cancer research. We have alumni that are leaders of industry in their fields. We have alumni that are educators and all over the place. And they're making a real impact in the world. And we just want to continue to facilitate that and allow our students to be the best at doing that. So that's what we're doing here today. What we're going to talk about is these three key points. And I'm going to try to move through this quickly, but not too fast so that you miss things because I don't want that to be the case. So we're going to talk about why we're going to be looking at the IB Diploma Program. Why I think, personally, it's the best program for you to have your son or daughter involved in. Uh, we're going to look at what is the program about here at St. Andrews. This is a little more about the structure and what it looks like sort of day to day. And then I'm going to be discussing with you uh, something that's new and coming on stream, which is called the Alternative Pathway. And that's a very exciting development. And we'll look at how that might look um, should you choose that route as well. So I like to always start with the IB in a nutshell. <laughs> real quick, real key talking points, if you will, the key things that most people need to know. It is the gold standard of post-16 educational programs globally. This is the one that is viewed to be one of the top of the top, if not the top. You go around the world, you go to colleges in England, in Canada, and this is the entrance requirement. This is it. And not only is this it, but they're expecting some pretty rigorous standards for this as well. They expect scores that are pretty high and so forth. And when you talk to these college admissions counselors, they understand that these diploma students are top tier students. Maybe not academically 4.0 GPA students, but they're tough students, they're critical thinking students, they're the type of students that universities are really targeting these days. It's a rigorous course. <laughs> you can talk, uh, you had a daughter go through, right? I mean, she can attest to it is tough. It is tough. You as well? Yeah. So, I mean, it is, it is a program that is not easy. We tell the students, in fact, one of the first opportunities for me at the beginning of grade 11 when I have all of the 11 sitting in front of me is I tell them you are about to begin possibly the hardest thing you've ever done in your life so far and their eyes get really big right but it's the truth and it's designed that way it's not designed that way to crush their spirit it's not designed that way to weed out the weak ones it's designed that way to challenge to make you grow as a student to make you better than you were before and sometimes the lessons you're going to learn through this program are not the book stuff or what the teacher told you. It's going to be 
What do I do when I'm starting to feel overwhelmed? What do I do when I feel like my back is against the wall a bit? How do I handle that? And so that time management, coping skills, what we call grit, that's almost a bigger part of what the students are going to learn through going through this program. It develops that whole person. We do not just want academically smart people. <laughs> if we wanted that, we could do another program that just focuses on you learn this stuff, you get a good grade in this exam. The IB Diploma Program asks the student to be academically strong, but also to be involved in community service, to be creative, to go out there and do some exercise. Yeah, you got to study, but you can go do something physical as well. It asks students to maybe get a little bit out of their comfort zone from time to time. And that's, again, a very good thing because when they leave here, they are going to be adaptable. They're going to be flexible. They're going to not be afraid of trying some new things. And graduates are highly sought after. Admiss Bodhi, please uh, asked her to come today, and she's here as well, so she can um, lend some attesting to that fact. IB diploma graduates, um, we always say that, you know, there's, there's thousands or hundreds of applications for any school. And these admissions advisors or officers are going looking at these stacks and stacks and stacks. And kids have extracurriculars and they've got GPAs that are through the roof and everything else. But I can guarantee you in almost every case, when they see IB diploma student, now that's not automatic you're getting in, but certainly that application moves up in the pile a little bit, right? That definitely speaks for something. Again, understanding what's involved, okay? And of course, if you do manage to score very highly in the diploma, you start having colleges fight over you as a student. You know, I want you to come, here's a scholarship. No, I want you to come, here's more of a scholarship and so forth. So parents always want to know, again, why should we do this? And I've summarized it down to six key points, if you will. Um, and I, I've arranged them, in my opinion, in order of importance. And the first one for me is always that maturity of the student and preparation for that university experience. My first year of university was not easy. <laughs> My first year of university, I was one of the top performing students at Kingsway the year I graduated. I think I was like fourth in my class. Um, that year, my school sent, I think, a group of about 15 or 20 students to Government House for some special academic recognition. So we were a very strong group of students. And <laughs> that was in the mid-90s. <clears throat> Not going to infer anything about that, but that was, that was a, yeah. Um, and, and so I thought I was the bee's knees. I mean, I had this thing down. I'm ready for university. And my mother was like, eh. I had just turned 17 in April and graduated in June. And I thought I'm ready to go. So we made applications. I, I was fortunate enough to get into the University of Florida which again, just swole my head a little bit more, right? Because that's not an easy school to get into. And I got there and I'm ready. Mom, thank you, mom. I'll see you later, bye. And mother left and I was on my own. And it was great for about three days. <laughs> and then the work started and a combination of bad uh, um, academic advice from counselors, um, a combination of me not being ready for that experience. Uh, internet gaming was kind of just taking off at this time. So I kind of got caught up in that. And I just completely fell apart. And it was a horrible year for me. And I ended up having to stay through the summer to just get my GPA up enough to transfer out. And I came home and I took six months off and I worked for six months. And then I finally went back to a smaller university and I was a little more focused, I was a little more mature at that point and I did much better, thankfully. Or else I wouldn't be standing here today. Um, and so, I think had I had that opportunity to have the experience of being challenged before I went away. And this is what I tell parents too. Your kids are going to run into this. They're going to get to the first year of university and it's going to smack them in the face. Hi, welcome to university. I don't care who you are anymore. <laughs> you just have work to do. The due dates are these dates and just get it done. Right? And some kids respond to that well. Some kids don't. And I was one that didn't. But I would rather, if it were my son, when he gets to this age, many years from now, I would rather him go through that experience here, where he's got a group of teachers around him who are concerned about him, who are going to contact me if they see anything, the, the kind of big red flags, I notice the big change in behavior, what's going on. 
um, where Miss Bodie can have him in the office to kind of calm him down and reassure him, where you are there or I am there in the evenings when he comes home stressed out, we can talk about it. That support system is there, but they're getting the university experience. So they get to develop this grit, but with a safety net, if you will. And they're a year older, they're more mature. College age students, entry level college age students in America are 18. I did the math, I did the research and I found that standard age, average age of a college freshman is 18 years old. Now, we have this legacy issue of leaving at the end of grade 11, which for some students still works, I guess. But when I looked at the average age of a class last year or the year before, a grade 11 class, and I put all the numbers in and I averaged it out at graduation, 17. So it is literally a year early. We are fighting the, in our community this perception that it isn't a year early, that in fact staying for grade 12 is a year extra. But in the overall scheme of looking at things globally, it isn't. It is where they should be. So if we send our kids out early, they're not ready for it. So I think maturity and maturity as a student, maturity in general, big part of that. Life skills, again, huge part of what they learn. Time management is huge. We just had our grade 12 students lead an assembly on Tuesday, Wednesday, Wednesday. And the assembly focused on sort of, you know, what, what should you tell these other students about the IB program? What do they need to know? And the message kept coming through again and again, manage your time. Don't leave things to the last minute. Be good and organized. And so really that's a key part. And I mean, I think I know some adults that could probably benefit from that lesson a little bit, myself included. So it's still a bit of a learning curve, but that's gonna be a big part of what they get. Nowhere yet have we got to academics. <laughs> this is developing that whole student, a big focus. Now we get to the academics. Course content, a lot of the IB course content is college level stuff. We have students who come back after their first year or during their first year and they go, man, Miss Bodie, man, Mr. Lowe, I'm sitting in some of them classes half asleep because I've done all of this before. I'm hearing it again and I'm, I'm in there and I'm showing up because I, you know, I don't want to miss anything, but it's hard, you know, because all these kids are struggling and I'm just like, I know this. And we get that. In some cases, um, you find that it's the skill set, research writing, you know, that extended essay, they're comfortable. They can kick out a paper like that. They're used to working at that level. So I had a student tell me in another case, they had a class where you had to stand and deliver a presentation much like this. And everyone in the room was panicking and she was sitting next to a person and the girl says, I've never done this before. I've never stood up and delivered a presentation. And I'm like, how did this girl come through high school and never once have to stand and deliver a presentation? Our kids get up and they, beep, 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 beep. they're quite happy to talk. So again, it's skills as well as content that our kids are getting. Credits, dependent on the school, big clause there, you can earn anywhere from a couple of courses worth of credits. Maybe you don't get any credit. Or you can get, in some cases, up to a full year. We've had that. We've had a student leave here and go to um, Rollins and started as a sophomore. That's how much credit she earned. And I think she's graduating, it's my niece, by the way, she's graduating, I think, next year. Or is it the end of this year? I gotta call her. But she's got like a double minor and her major because of all these extra credits and you know, and it's just like, psh. and that's not a rarity. That's quite often what we hear. You get credits for these courses that you take. So that saves you money in the end, even if it's not a scholarship. These things are what, like 300 and some dollars a credit hour? It's more modest universities, so. A, a year at McGill, and McGill's not a easy school. <laughs> Certainly not. Now we get to the questions I'm always asked about. Well, what about scholarships? Because <laughs> I know you guys are thinking retirement and you know, if you could not spend all your money on college, that would be good. I'm already planning for college and my son's in ELC. Because so <laughs> I want to retire at some point in my life. Um, so in some cases and in some past years, we've had million dollar classes as we've called them. Um, students who are on full rides. Students who are on significant scholarships, not full rides, but they earned a fair amount of credit. Now, I do put in here as well the sort of disclaimer that the whole student aspect also contributes to that. It's not just the academic score. 
They're looking for that well-rounded student, the student that's involved in all these other things, that's demonstrating more than academic strength. But again, the academic strength of the course also factors in, okay? Now, you do need to score a certain level if you want to start hearing about scholarships, and I would say that's probably in the mid to upper 30s is where those doors start opening. The higher up you go, the more those doors open. Um, some of them are just creaked, but... And then here's the last one, that university admissions makes it stand out, makes it um, different than the others, uh, makes your student stand out for those other reasons we talked about. If your son or daughter is looking at a European or Canadian school, Ms. Bodhi, tell them. It's a must-have. Must those universities are going to tell you straight, if you don't have an IB diploma, you could do a foundation year, which is basically like a college prep year, and then maybe we'll let you in. <laughs> but if you have a diploma, they'll say, okay, we'll look at you. And then I had a student the other day I was talking to, her family is from Switzerland. And of course, they would love for her to go back to Switzerland. University of Zurich was where her father went, and it's a great school. And we were looking at the entrance requirements, and it's like IB diploma off the bat. 34 points minimum. Must have higher level biology, must have standard level math, must have this, must have that. And they're very particular. And that's just to be considered. So again, if you are hoping to go to Europe or Canada, you better let them know now. This is almost guaranteed a need, unless you want to spend extra time and money trying to get what you need to get in. So what does the curriculum look like? This continuum is a key part of this as well. And this is an advantage that you get from having students in St. Andrews from early on all the way through. Our students in the primary years are working on skills that are IB skills. This is an IB program. And it's instilling some of those foundational skills in our students in order to prepare them moving up. Now, in other schools, there's what's called the MYP. This is the IB's middle years program. Here at St. Andrews, though, we have on our own middle years diploma for a whole variety of reasons. Primarily though, because we are able to tailor it to fit our local environment specifically. Um, the MYP also has some assessment, uh, assessment things associated with it that are a whole heck of a lot of work and don't always fit, I think, with what we envision the program should be. So we've done our own and that's where your middle years come in. That's grades six through 10. And then in the end here is grades 11 and 12, which is the diploma program. All right, so why did I show you this? Well, we've done work as a staff where we've grouped teachers from ELC, primary, middle school, and secondary teachers, and we put them at a table and we said, okay, um, and I pulled out, for example, from the, and this is a science teachers from all levels or people with science background, and I pulled out an IB biology learning objective. Students are able to do X, Y, Z, or know this. And I said to them, let's map this back. And those teachers are able to map it out all the way down through the IGCSE courses, what leads to this, and then to middle school, what leads to that, and so forth. And so we've established a chain all the way down to ELC. So when my son is learning how to write the letter T for his name, obviously that's the foundation skill for writing an extended essay. That seems like quite a leap, but everything leads to the next. And I won't call names, but I will say that I've had conversations with parents whose kids are in other schools, and the transition from primary to secondary, it's almost like they're two separate schools, and they got extra classes to be prepared for secondary. And I'm like, well, what, what was primary for if that didn't prepare you for secondary? You get that here, and your kids will be coming through that diploma, um, the whole thing. So the structure, what this looks like. We show this diagram, and I'm going to fly through some of this, but the key points are coming up. And that's generally how the IB depicts this program altogether. At the very center, we have this IB learner profile. And these traits, again, are what we expect or hope our students to become. And you know, these are probably phrases you've heard thrown around in various venues. But even an IB student, if you apply these things across the board to them, it makes them a pretty good, well-rounded individual, right? So that's, again, the foundation of everything, and that's why it's right in the dead center. If you notice right around that, approaches to teaching and approaches to learning. Now, these are things that maybe are a bit more explicit to us teachers because we are aware of them and are conscious of them in our curriculum. Maybe students don't see them as discrete things, but they are experiencing them. 
And these are things that we look to bring through in our teaching, in our assessment, and so forth. And I think, again, skills that are all in making for a very well-rounded individual. Interestingly enough, a few years ago, I found an article on Forbes, and it's a little cut off. So 10 skills employers most want in 2015 graduates going into university. And these are the top 10 skills that they wanted. Work in a team structure, make decisions and solve problems, which was a tie for first. Um, communicate verbally, plan, organize, all these great things here. And if you go back and look at that, Communication skills, social skills, which is working in groups as well, self-management skills as organization, thinking skills as being able to come up with unique and interesting solutions. I think we're providing what these students are going to need to be successful and out there in the wider world, even not just at university. Now we get to my favorite part, this ring right here. And this is often referred to as the core, the core of the diploma program. And the core is made up of these three parts. There's the extended essay, CAS, and TOK. Now, you're probably familiar with CAS. I'm sure your son or daughter has dragged you out to a thing or twice or whatever. I've got to get CAS. <laughs> Mr. Wilson's going to kill me. Um, so we'll get to that. The first one is the extended essay. This is the big one. This is the big mountain that many students feel that they have to climb, especially in, in grade 12. 4,000 word research paper, independent self-directed research college-level research. The expectation is students are going to, in one of the subject areas that are offered through the IB, not necessarily one they're taking, but one we recommend they're taking, got to come up with a research question. And they've got to go out and research, collect data, analyze, answer the question in 4,000 words. Now, this takes place over a year and a half. We usually start it um, somewhere right around January of grade 11. And by, well, I guess it's actually more of a year, isn't it? By about December at the latest of year 12, we want it wrapped up. It used to be a little longer, but we found that it gets in the way of other things. So a year of work for the student. They are given a faculty advisor, a subject area specialist. So if I'm writing an English extended essay, I might meet with Mr. McKenzie periodically for feedback on the content. And then we, um, just this year, added this wonderful lady over here, Ms. Martin who serves as a librarian, but also she's the research leader for the school. So I kind of lean on her heavily in terms of providing guidance through the process. So she gives them advice and guidance on what is good research, where to go find good research, the structure of their paper, um, are they going to get the points, and so forth. And so she's my sort of extended essay watchdog, if you will. So in combination with those faculty advisors, the student gets support. But it's ultimately their paper to write. All right. CAS, again, we're very familiar with, is the focus on the whole student, creativity, activity, and service. Students are not given a set hour number by the IB. This is a question I get. Is there a certain number of hours I must get? Technically, no. <laughs> but the IB wants to see balance. They want to see a volume, yes, but they also want to see balance across the areas. We've given our students a number to work towards because we think they'd like to have a target to set. But Ultimately, they don't want a student who's all activity. They play softball, they play soccer, they play basketball, and that's it. They want a student who's done some creative things, who's given some back to the community through service, and so forth. And I will say this is dri driven through the house system this year. It's a new change. So the house leaders are responsible for the kids in their house um, to ensure that they're providing opportunities for CAS in school, um, after school as well, but um, to help provide this opportunity for students to do it. We now do it all the way down through, I think, the primary school, where students are involved in CAS all the way through. So this will become a part of the culture. It won't be this thing I have to do. It'll just be something I do naturally. All right, but at this point, it may still be a bit of a I have to do. All right, uh, students are expected to have at least one, I think, long-term CAS project in grade 11 and 12. They kind of work on over a period of time. We've had students organize um, wonderful like talent shows or other displays of talent. We've had students that have been involved in um, bigger things like uh, we used to have a group that did, um, what was it called, the water group? Uh, Charity, water. Charity Water. So they were involved in raising funds and working with getting funds for this organization that can build wells in Africa. Um, there was a group that did Operation Smile, which is the cleft palate. So students engage in these longer term things as well. AIDS Foundation was another one, yeah. 
All right, and then the key thing as well, we don't just ask them to log hours. We want you to reflect on it. This is a big part of what they have to do. You have to sit down and you have to say, I went and played softball today and it taught me some lessons or I had a thought about this or you know, we lost the game, but you know, I think we played hard. And that reflection is important, you know, because again, we want you to think about the impact of these actions. We want you to think about how you've helped others, how you've helped yourself and so forth. This one's my favorite of them all. This is the one I teach, and so I'm very passionate about theory of knowledge. The students, not so much. Um, I've heard this course called The Devil. Um, I've heard this course called Mr. Lowe Just Trying to Confuse Us. Um, I've heard it called possibly some swear words under their breath. I'm not sure. Um, but it's a very good course. It is essentially a course on epistemology, which is a fancy word of the study of knowledge. Okay? We encourage students to reflect on the nature of knowledge and pretty much how it is you know what you think you know. And so for currently in grade 11, Ms. Martin and I are doing grade 11 and we're working through what we call ways of knowing. And these are eight ways of knowing that the IB is classified as how you gain knowledge about the world around you. And I've talked about like sense perception, for example. Your senses are a big part of how you gain knowledge. And I explain how they work. Your eyes don't see, your ears don't hear. They are organs that sense. And your eye reacts to light and produces an electrical signal, a little pulse of electricity that goes into your brain. And your brain says, oh, electrical signal. What does this mean? Mm, and it creates this image that you are now seeing. And they kind of go, what? That's not what I was told in middle school biology. The eyes see and the ears hear. Um, and when we really get down to it, I say, well, so basically everything's electrical signals in your brain. And what if your brain's not working correctly and it's getting extra signals or whatever? So we look at how that might in fact affect what they know from their sense perception. And we do that through lots of them. There's emotion, there's intuition, there's reason, there's um, all sorts of other ones. And it's a course that ultimately gets them thinking critically. In the end, students have to present a presentation, 10 minute presentation, where they've taken a real life situation that they've come across. So I might've read an article on Donald Trump, something he said, there's enough of that going around, right? And I found an article that made me go, huh, that's interesting. And from that, the student ends up asking a question about knowledge. So he may look at um, Donald Trump used this word to describe the media, right? Or whatever. And the effect that that has on people's, how people view news. And so the student then goes, well, what effect does language have, the language used, have on how we interpret a situation? And they look at that and they analyze it and then they apply it to other things. And so, you know, if I, if I call someone a derogatory name for their, um, for their race or for their, for their class or whatever, how does that affect how I might perceive that person? And so it takes them down that rabbit hole of the implications of that. It's a very fun course to teach. It takes them a while to warm up to it. I find though by the end of grade 12, most of them are quite comfortable with this. I had a student come back the other day we dragged him through this program. I'm not going to lie to you. It was kicking and screaming the whole way. Right, Ms. Bodie? You know what I'm talking about. And he came back and he was smiling. He's gone to a join a pre-law program in England. And he was like, my very first class? Man, I was using all that TOK stuff I had. But I showed up and the professor gave us this thing to debate. And I stood up and I was like, boom, 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 boom. And everyone's eyes are really big. And man, that was easy. So there was a student who despised this course, but once they got out there, they went, yeah, this is useful. I could use this. And, and you know, it's always good to hear those stories when they come back and share those things with us. All right, now we get to the part that most people seem to be most aware of. And these are the classes, right? Because this is what you most probably hear the most about. And the IB courses are spread across six groups. This is a liberal arts style program. That means that it encourages students to be experiencing lots of other th things that maybe they're not 100% comfortable with, a well-rounded individual. So we've got our language A, which is sort of your mother tongue, that's English for us here at this school. Um, your acquisition language is group two, Spanish, French. Um, group three is individuals and societies, that's your social studies type stuff, you know, business, history, geography, and so forth. Sciences in group four, uh, group five is your mathematics, and group six is your arts or an elective. So on offer here at St. Andrews, these are the courses we currently offer. Now for a course to run, 
Later in um, about January, your sons and daughters will be given the opportunity to sign up for some courses. And if less than five people choose a course, then it probably won't run. That's a standard policy of the school for various reasons. But these are what they will be offered. Language and literature is the only English option. Okay? It is a great course. It covers both literature and language, which looks at not like grammar and vocabulary, but the use of language, again, in these contexts and so forth. So it's a very good course. It's standard level or higher level. Uh, we have our foreign languages, Spanish, French, and I've put an asterisk here for Mandarin. I'll put that on there just to gauge interest in it, um, but we'll see. You know, and if there's enough students interested, we may see if we can make that happen. But definitely Spanish and French. Now, these are available at three levels, and this ab initio is sort of the only odd one. The ab initio is a beginner level. Okay, that's, uh, I can say hola and como esta, and that's about it. And so I'm going to do ab initio because that's probably going to be, uh, it's more like conversational Spanish, I guess, in a way. Uh, whereas the standard level assumes a little more mastery. And the higher level of these, your son or daughter needs to be fluent. I mean, because the higher level in foreign languages involves literature review in that language. So they got to read a book in that language and then write a literary analysis in that language. And so, of course, that's a bit beyond most students who've done high school Spanish or French. Okay. Group three is always a popular group. Um, these classes are, are hard decisions for many students. Psychology, geography, business, and history. Um, I think in some cases it's the personalities involved in these courses. I know Miss Gator is a popular choice in business, mostly because it's Miss Gator. And who doesn't want to be in class with Miss Gator? Um, but, you know, we have lots of other good teachers involved as well. So please encourage your son or daughter to branch out. Um, the only one that really we encourage prior knowledge for in this case is probably the history. It's not mandatory in any of the others or even really in history, but I think in that case you might find the skill set provided earlier on helps. But obviously no one does psychology prior to this, so we can't expect a student to have it. Geography, yeah, you could pick up IB geography. And business management, again, there may not really be anything prior that's, although the IGCSE will. Your sciences are always a fun set. <clears throat> and before you point out that there's one missing, it's there, it's just not in this group. We have biology, physics, a course called Environmental Systems and Societies, and computer science, which is a science, trust me. Um, these are your more traditional ones. Most people are familiar with those. ESS is a course that straddles the line between group three, the INS, and group four, the sciences. So it's got some elements of geography, some elements of sort of like a human science to it, you know, migration or human impact on the environment, but it also incorporates scientific elements of that. How do you quantify human impact on the environment? So it's, a, it's viewed to be the easy science by the students, but I would say that the ESS teachers might argue that point, that it's not, in fact, really that easy. Interestingly enough, though, it's only standard level, and I'll come back to what that is going to mean in, the, in a minute. Computer science is a course where the students are examining computers from a college level. So I used to teach it as a programming course. Ms. Davis teaches it now. Um, she focuses on database, which I mean, we're talking the students produce a professional quality database that's quite complex in the end as their final project. But there is some elements of programming in there, and there's some elements of sort of um, computer structure and, and, and theory. So it's a, not an easy course. It's certainly not using Office and, and browsing the web. That's not what that course is about. Mathematics is a course that in a few years is going to be get going, undergoing quite a facelift, but for now it's still what it was. We have three levels of math, and the right one is going to make all the difference to your son or daughter. Okay? Math studies is, again, the easy math, although I've seen some of the stuff they do in math studies and I would struggle. Um, math studies, again, only standard level. It is for students that don't need math for university. They may have to take a math course in university as like a general elective requirement, but certainly they don't need it. It's not like they're doing engineering or biomedicine or something like that that's going to require a lot of complex calculations, right? That's math studies. Math SL is probably maybe the standard that most go for if they can manage it. 
Um, and then math higher level is if you like you go home, you go to bed at night and you dream about math and you do math for fun, like in your home room, you know, in your in your living room while you're watching TV, you're solving equations for fun. Like that's that person. We strongly advise against math higher level unless we are confident the student has the aptitude for it and needs it. OK, some like to do it so that they could say they did it, but it's not an easy course. And globally, it is viewed that way, not just at St. Andrews. So don't think it's a St. Andrews math problem. It's a global problem with higher level math. <laughs> it's not an easy course. We do have a student this year doing it. I think he's going to do all right. He's a very brainiac kind of kid. Group six of the arts, the much often forgotten about arts. You know, my son or daughter's got to get into a competitive university, and he is not going to get in there with visual arts on his transcript. They are not going to be happy with that. Well, again, it depends on the school and what they're looking for with this whole well-rounded individual thing. Exposure to the arts has been, through research, been proven time and again to have a positive impact on other subject areas, science, math, other areas like that. It is also a very good outlet creatively for students. You're going to find that they're stressed. They're freaking out. Ms. Martin is going to be rolling out later this year as they get closer to exams, a coloring corner in the library <laughs> where she's just going to have like mandalas and other little like, you know, things with some colored pencils. And we've already told the grade 12s, you need a break, come down here and color. It sounds silly, but it's, it's a stress reliever and it, it helps just. Oh. And so I tell students, you know, you could almost look at it like that. These are not easy courses. They're not like blow offs at all. Visual arts, um, if any of you made it to the um, exhibition last year, did anyone get to that? No? The uh, grade 12 students last year put on this wonderful exhibition. Of course, John Cox helped spearhead that. He partnered with the Lyford Key School students, and they did it at Pop-Op Studios. And the work was beautiful. It was laid out like a proper exhibition. The following week was the, um, the local art tour where they go around, what is that called? Do you remember? Ah, uh, transforming, transforming spaces, right, yeah. And so they convinced Pop-Off Studios, because it's Mr. Cox's kind of in there, is, as I think it's his studio. But they said, we'll leave their work up, and it'll become a stop on the tour. The comments that came out of people that came on that tour, these are people who've just been around the island looking at professional artwork. They were floored by this work. They were like, oh my god, a student did this? Look at this. There were offers to purchase. I think some students actually sold some work for some serious amount of money and so forth. So that means that this is not easy art. It's not just drawing pictures. There's an expectation of analysis of art. They've got to do a comparative study of several artists' work that's, again, pretty in-depth and so forth. Theater, um, if you talk to any of our current theater students, they will tell you this is not just drama. This is not acting. This the craft of acting, the craft of theater, which goes beyond just how to present a character on stage and how to remember lines, but how to market a play, how to direct a play, all of those skills as well. So it's, it, again, is not an easy course. Music, Miss Peterson, of course, will be more than happy to tell you is not easy. Um, in fact, she recommends to do music at IB level that you've done some music prior. Um, either you play outside of school or you've done like the IGCSE, BGCSE music. Higher level music is composing music, writing your own pieces. Not something that most people can do. I've played piano since I was like nine years old and I could not write my own song. I can play them beautifully, but write my own, that's a whole other ball game. Here's that missing science. <laughs> Why is it in here? Why is it in here? Well, we've found from talking to students, some students need two sciences. Their university programs really would like them to have two sciences. If you're going to go off to study mechanical engineering, for example, it is most commonly accepted that you're going to need physics and chemistry. So we put chemistry here in the group six option so they can take their chemistry and take physics in group four. If you're going to do something to do with biology, medicine, you know, be a doctor or whatever, you're going to need biology and chemistry. Now we've not found any real programs that we've found where they're going to need biology and physics. And if that is the case, you can talk to us and we can always figure out a way to make it work. But generally, I think across the board, Ms. Bodhi, am I correct? It's either bio, chem, or physics, chem. And that's why we put chemistry here. 
Now, we used to have a ton of other options in here. You know, there used to be another business course in here. There used to be another psychology course in here. One year there was geography in here. And it really took away from the arts. And I'm a big proponent of the arts. And I really do think and believe strongly in that being involved in them is good for your student. So the deci decision was made to scale it back to just the chemistry as the only elective. Um, again, if there are special circumstances, as I know we have a case in grade 11, the same girl going to Switzerland, um, she's actually doing two foreign languages. She's doing French, higher level, and Spanish ab initio. And so she's not doing a, an art, and she's doing like a self-directed French higher level course because she's a native language speaker. So for her, it's, she's just reading books that she would have been reading anyway. So in that case, we made a, a special exception, but we'll deal with those on a one-on-one -on -one situation. So don't, you know, don't panic if it seems restrictive, but that's what we'd like them to work with. So a, f a year or two ago when I did this presentation, I asked a few people, teachers, if you were picking, what would you pick? And this is my schedule. That's my, if I had to select classes, this is what I would select here. I would say, uh, I'm going to do those things. And uh, yeah, because I, 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 Spanish, I did Spanish in high school, but uh, I can't remember a whole lot. And it never took to it. Um, I love history, so I think I'd do well there. Computer science, duh. Right, that's what I taught for years. Math SL, and I, I wanted to do art. I thought art would be good for me, and I'm, I'm somewhat creative. So there I am, right? Uh, Ms. Dillette. Ms. Dillette made courses selections. Remember doing that for me? She's like, she's looking, what did I choose? She said, Langwin Lit HL. She said, French SL, because I think you uh, got that French Canadian thing going on. Well, there you go. <laughs> Maybe ab initio then, Ms. Dillette. We'll try SL and see how it goes. Um, geography SL, bio HL, because I think that was a big part of your degree, right? You did a lot of bio. Math SL, and visual arts higher level. I was like, look at you, higher level visual arts. She's, she's got ambitions. All right, Mr. Stitch. Um, Mr. Stitch had a bit of a surprise. I mean, history's no surprise. He's a historian. Of course he would do history. Um, he shied away from the sciences a little bit. He did ESS. He's like, I'm not gonna do anything scientific, so I'll do ESS. That's kind of a general, general science type thing. Math studies, I'm like, look, math studies, wow, okay, again, for history focused, doesn't need a big math, so he did a math studies. Um, drama, drama? <laughs> I can only assume that he deals with enough drama on a given day, and therefore he's a, a, adept at handling it, so maybe that's why, but um, he did have an appearance in a play a year or two ago, if you remember, he made an appearance in The Sound of Music. And he made an appearance in the fairy tale Christmas Carol too, didn't he? Yes, he did. So he's known to uh, get out there a little bit from time to time. So interestingly enough, that's his schedule. So that brings us to the final ring, which is this international mindedness. And that's the one that I think oftentimes as a school, people kind of view locally a little bit like a hmm, little bit of side eye on that international. That, that's a bit of a nasty word at times. But you have to understand that this international and proudly Bahamian, we really do mean that. We want our students to be exposed to a global mindset, but we also always encourage and always help them to understand and apply what they're learning to the local environment. In TOK, I'm often making references to things in our local news, what's going on locally. Um, I'm always trying to bring it back so they can see it applies here. Even at St. Andrews, how does this fit? Okay, so this is a big part of it, international and proudly Bahamian. So keep that in mind as well. All right. Doing good on time? Doing good on time. And I know this is a lot of information, so thank you for sticking with me. Um, when making a decision to do this program, students are faced with two sort of roads to go down at the moment. You can do what's called the full diploma, and that's the standard course of study, right? It's six classes, one from each of those groups. You have to do three of them at higher level. Now, higher level course isn't always different, it's often the same as the standard level course with a little extra on it, a little extra extension work, a little, a little uh, different skill set added on. But standard and higher level students quite often, in almost every case, are in the same classroom with the same time doing the same work for a significant portion of the program. It's usually in the year two where they start to like, branch off a little more uh, in some places. Students doing the diploma must complete the core, the extended essay, CAS and theory of knowledge. They must, okay? They don't have a choice there. And they've got to get a passing mark on each. Overall, they've got to score 24 points. And 12 of them must be from higher levels. So, and I'll come back to certificates in a second. 
So I took a sample, I just made up a schedule here, and I said, let's say this was student X, and, or maybe this is me, let's say it's me. And these are my final IB results. This is what comes back from the IB. So I got a six in language and literature, a five in Spanish. This is on the one to seven scale. Um, five, five, four, didn't do too good at math. Six in visual arts. I got a B in TOK and a B in extended essay. Now, how does that work out for me? Well, if I take the B, oh, sorry, yeah, the, the, these letter grades are different, aren't they? I mean, they're, they're not one to seven. And they do that because these two elements combine to give you bonus points if you will. So if I take the B and the B, and this is the matrix for that, and I've given this to students and this will be available to them to reference. I got a B on extended essay and a B on my TOK, I get two bonus points. Super. Okay, you can get up to three bonus points. Um, please notice an E, which is a failing grade on either, eliminates you from the diploma altogether. You fail your extended essay, you fail CAS, you fail TOK, you're done. <laughs> That's not good. We work diligently to ensure that that doesn't happen. And in fact, in my time here, I don't think I've ever seen it happen, especially not being IB coordinator, I've not seen it happen. So we can hang our hat on that. So how does that work? I add up these points, boop, 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 and I get 31. And then I get the two points for this, and a student has got 33 points. That's the number the universities are looking at. That's what they hang their hats on. They say, I got 33. And a 33 is a good performance. That's a solid performance by a student. That's getting up there into those higher levels. Um, you have to pass CAS as well. And I tell students this, this is, I, it boggles my mind, but when I went to training, they told us it is the number one reason that students fail the diploma, because they didn't pass CAS. Yeek, how do you do that? How, how does that even happen? <laughs> You've got two years, do some stuff and reflect on it. Like, so again, our system, I think, prevents this from happening, and I've never seen a student fail here because of no CAS. And that's, again, the support system in place to, uh, you have to actively go out of your way. Um, so going back to the other half of this is certificates. Now, depending on the student, depending on the college path going on after this, some students don't need that full diploma because this is a rigorous course. This is a lot of stuff. A student can choose to do certificates, and they can take any number of classes they want. They can take four, five, all six. They can take any number of them at higher level. So you can do only one, you can do none, whatever. The core becomes optional. Most students tend to drop the extended essay if they're not interested, or some students keep those things because it looks good on the transcript and earns credits. And basically, you just have to score a four in each of your classes. If you get a minimum of four, you get a certificate for each class. So this kind of almost becomes more like AP courses or A levels, if you want to look at it that way, individual things that you get. Um, this is a very valid option. It's been frowned upon historically here at St. Andrews as like lesser than, you know, my son or daughter's good enough to do the diploma, and so I don't want to entertain that. Well, you know what? We've had students, my niece in particular, the student that got that full year's worth of credit at university when she started, certificate student. She, start, she did, I think, four, four classes. She still did an extended essay because she, she was passionate about it. I think she still did her CAS. She dropped TOK. She focused on courses that fit, like she did business at higher level because that's what she was going to study and so forth. And she went off to university, and that particular university took those credits and ran with it, and she was quite happy, and she's doing quite well for herself. They do the same work, they do the same content, they do the same exam at the end of the course, the same coursework, everything's the same, just they don't have all of these requirements as well. So that conversation is an important one to have with that lady right there. <laughs> and I tell students, before you make big decisions, go talk to Miss Bodie. Because some students, their college aspirations aren't Ivy League schools, and that's fine. The school I ended up at was certainly not an Ivy League school, but it was a good school. And I would have been quite happy or quite fine being a certificate student. All right, I'm moving through, moving through. Here's what grade 11 and 12 tend to look like for IB students, just kind of key points. Cast focus in grade 11, lots of work, lots of work. Some IAs in practice will begin. You'll start to see elements of it come through. They begin the extended essay usually in January of that year. We start the process. And we do end of year exams in June, which are like mini mocks, if you will. Grade 12 is where the rubber hits the road. They're, they're working hard here, but they don't really feel it until grade 12. Lots of IAs are 
do. And we try to spread them out over the year. Completion of the extended essay is usually November 1st is the deadline. And that gives us some time to polish and fix any big errors if there are any. I put that there. IB fees are due also on November 1st. These are registration fees. Um, ballpark of anywhere to $1,000 to $1,200. <gasps> Um, that's external fees. That's not St. Andrews. We don't keep that money. I would very much like to keep that money, but we don't. Um, it just, you give it to us and we send it to the IB. Um, when you consider though, again, one college course, one three credit college course is about $1,500 these days, right? Am I, am I accurate? Parents that have kids in college? Is that about right? I guess it depends on the school. Um, so you could be looking at credits worth of savings way beyond what you're paying for. So look at it as an investment, if you will, all right? Students do mocks in February to March, and then they do exams in May, okay? The final exams in May, and then they're all done, and they don't know what to do with their lives after that. And they have no Christmas. And they have, they, well, <laughs> yeah, one year you gotta sacrifice and push through, but again, they try to, try to get it done. I've had students come to me after the exams in May and they're like zombies. They're like, Mr. L, I don't know what to do. I went home last night. I had no studying. I had no homework. I had nothing. I didn't know what to watch TV, I guess. I don't know. So it's an adjustment for them. This is the other thing that we're rolling out this year and we're formalizing it now. And I wanted to talk about it because again, I think it's a great fit for some people. And I would like to encourage you if your son or daughter, and I'm going to tell this to them as well, if they're interested to come talk to me more about it. We're going to be rolling out the, an alternative pathway, if you will. And again, we're fighting this perception that this is the lesser course. This is like for the dummies. It isn't. The BTEC Creative Digital Media Production course, looking through it, is industry level work. This is preparing students to go out there and go straight into colleges that are going to be more technical, more focused on the skill set involved. It's scheduled against MFL subjects at the moment. So instead of doing a foreign language, a student would do this. Um, and it's useful for students that would be interested in any of these types of fields if they're sincerely thinking this is what they'd like to do beyond um, college. This is a very good course because it gives you a lot of practical hands-on skills to do just that. Some of the mandatory units that they're going to study, these are what they have to study. And they'll work through these units um, in, in the course of two years. And then they can choose um, some options over there depending on their focus. So some students might really like digital games and game production is a valid industry these days. It's quite, quite in depth. Um, or maybe they want to do more film or so forth. Again, if your son or daughter has displayed a propensity for this or has expressed a desire to look into this, please do not shy away from this. This is not a lesser course. They are going to produce a portfolio of work from this that they can then show to a university program that will, will make a difference in their application. It is meant to be that high level work. We're partnering with several of our parents who are involved in radio. Um, we have connections obviously at um, cable news, the um, Our News. We have production people that do advertisements and, and print media and so forth. And we're gonna be bringing them in to help us tailor this program to fit the needs that they would want to see in someone coming out of school. What would they need to know? So we're gonna try to make sure that it is exactly what it should be. And we have the flexibility, again, to tailor it to our local environment. Um, a third branch of this, so to speak, is something we rolled out this last year, and it's worked really well. We have some students doing a certificates program, and their parents are going, well, I really don't want them having a ton of free time. So can they go off campus and do like work? And I'm like, well, fine. So we've worked it out where we actually have a work experience program where it's, we agree upon this with whoever they're going to work with. We had some students go last year to the sailing program. Marcus and Cochis went to do um, they helped out with the youth sailing that went on during the day. I think the government school kids that would come to do the sailing and they were serving as instructors. And so Mr. Dunkley at the club, he uh, at the sailing association, he signed off on this and, and there was a progress form that he had to fill out periodically and it ended up being graded. So they did get some credit for it as well. So we'd like to kind of work that in. So what might a schedule look like for a student who's interested in this type of a thing? Well, here it is. That's what a general day might look like for them or an overview of their schedule. They, they're doing some IB courses as certificates, doing the work like IB students and getting the benefits of all that. Here's their BTEC block where they're going to be doing these BTEC units and working through that. Um, maybe this student has opted to do some work experience where it's available in their schedule or maybe they've just opted to do it outside of school and this becomes a free block for study. But you see there's some IB things here. 
I'm thinking a kid like this may be a little more creative focused. So here's visual arts at a higher level, and they're going to still do the visual arts extended essay because they think it would you know, obviously be good for them to do. Business is a good foundation. Um, and some of the things in here are business type topics where you have media campaigns, and we can bring in some other options that are business options as well. All right, so that would, might be what an alternative pathway student schedule would look like. And again, it, if it's a good fit for your son or daughter, it would be a wonderful thing to have them be a part of the pilot group. It's scary to be the first. And everyone's like, well, I'd like to see it happening and I can talk to those kids and parents, but someone's got to be the first. Someone's got to be the trailblazer. And if it is your son or daughter, I can guarantee you that we're going to work very diligently to ensure that they get the best possible experience from that. Um, we don't want them to be the guinea pigs and we go, we'll fix all those problems you had. We'll fix it for the next group. We don't want it to be that. We want it to hit the ground running from day one. Okay? All right, I've talked a lot and I appreciate your attentiveness. No one fell asleep, so that's good. Kudos to you. Um, but is there any questions in general that anyone has at the moment? We do have a few more minutes before the, your sons and daughters come in to hear the same spiel. Yes? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> global average is 30 points globally um, and I've mapped it out for the last few years after exams every year we do a big ex exam analysis where we have this and you should see the sheet it's got everything laid out and numbers and predictors and everything else and mapping out the overall average ours has hovered at 30 now, there are years where we're above 30 there's been a, I think one year we got up to like 32 almost 33 um, and then there's been some years where we're 29. So our kids are hovering at that. Now, we've, as a part of those exam analysis meetings, though, set some very clear targets for ourselves as a school and each individual department as well, with a focus to improve the scores in each department in each area. Like, I'm involved in TOK, so Ms. Martin and I have done a lot of work on TOK and extended essay to maximize the bonus points that students can receive. We want to get them, everybody, to three bonus points if we can. So. Historically, we're hovering at the average, you know, a little fluctuation here and there from year to year. Um, but I would like to think projecting into the future, we're going to try to get that up above 30 consistently. So it's 33 or 34, 35 on average. And also, what does their daily schedule look like? Do they, um, do they have classes like the other students from mm -hmm. same, same schedule, timetable of the day. Um, you have your one hour blocks like everyone else and same breaks and everything. Um, and that's really it. Uh, I would say the only big difference you might find in a student in grade 12 primarily is if they're doing certificates, they may have some more free time where they've dropped those other courses. That free time, they can go up. There's a common room area up by my office. There's a lovely lounge that we've given them. And that area is for them only. And so if they have that free time, they can go up there and work quietly in there or come down here and find a space or whatever. That might be the only real difference you'd see on a screen. If there are any other questions at all, um, thank you again for coming. My email address is there, but um, feel free to email me, stop me in the hall or whatever if you've ever run across me. I'll be happy to answer any questions you have.